Hello, my name's Greg Thorpe of Islington Mill, and this is our 11th Memories of Living piece of work uh, where we meet with our artists, our staff, our tenants, and we find out what lockdown life has been like creatively, emotionally, you name it. And we've had short films, we've had interviews, we've had essays. Today, I'm in conversation with the one and only Cheddar Gorgeous. Cheddar is a drag artist who is based at the mill with the Drag Lab Collective, who is a growing and ever multiplying collection of artists. We'll hear a little bit more about that. I'm going to dive straight in. I've gone for a quiz show style of 10 quick fire questions. Piao, piao. Welcome, Cheddar. Hello there. How are you? Very well, thank you. I'm going to dive straight in with a tricky first question. What's your name and where do you come from? Well, my one of my names is Cheddar Gorgeous, and I come originally from Birmingham. At least that's the cover story I have. Uh, I'm also called Michael, and uh, yeah, mostly I'm based in Manchester. I've been here for the last 13 years. Can you please describe your creative practice for the viewers at home? So I fit broadly somewhere in what people call drag, but I tend to do a little bit more alternative drag. So I tend to do drag that explores things that go beyond a gender binary and uh, play a little bit more with the monstrous, the divine and the abstract. And Cheddar, for those not familiar with your work, are you in drag now? I am not in drag now. This isn't a really, really avant-garde piece, although I do have a really lovely shawl. Mm -hmm. And I think shawl, it's getting into the shawl season. Absolutely. And I think shawl, it's one of those things, isn't it, you can just play with. Gives it, you a bit of a drama. It's an instant look, isn't mm. it? Mm. Um, can I ask you, how are you feeling today, like right this minute? How are things with you? I'm feeling mischievous with a little edge of anxiety. Mm, edge of anxiety. Mm. Which should be, it's a good album name. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I feel like maybe Grimes or, you know, even <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Braga, actually. Yeah. Um, so what has a typical day in lockdown been like for you? What does a typical lockdown 24 hours look like for Cheddar? It's been quite mixed. So in lockdown two, as I call it, the sequel, mm -hmm. um, it's me getting up, forcing myself out of bed to um, work out on Zoom, because that helps me give a little bit of structure and ensures it doesn't stay up till 3 a.m. in the morning every night. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will make a coffee, open my computer. I've started getting into the habit now of trying to read a chapter of my book. Um, you know, not yeah. my book personally, it's not one I read, wrote, wrote even, um, before doing anything else. But mostly it's sitting at the computer, looking at funding grants, um, looking at emails, prepping work, and then on a treat day, I get to pop into the studio to prepare costume. Fantastic. Um, and have you learned anything new about yourself during the whole pandemic season? Do you know, I think I feel a little bit, I don't know if this counts as learning something about yourself. I think I feel more conscious of uncertainty in my life in a way that's a new experience for me. Um, and I'm, I've also learned that I find it very hard stopping. Right. Um, so the, the idea of just stopping working, um, that's something that doesn't occur to me. Um, and I struggle, I struggle with. Um, this feels like it's a, a prelude to a breakdown. And it might be. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think I've... I'm I'm learning um, about I'm I'm in a I'm learning that I'm resilient, but at the same time learning perhaps that those things might become a little bit of a problem in the future. I hear you. Um, how long have you been at Islington Mill? What's your connection to the mill? What do you do there? And what's your experience of being part of the mill been like? I think I've been there about five years now, or something like that. Feels like it must be, it must be approaching that period. And we were invited in as part of um, the Launchpad project, was it, or something like that? Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. The, the Launchpad project, which was um, uh, trying to get, uh, treating the mill as an incubator for new arts organisations and fun things happening. And we, we had a little studio space where we'd do drag from, make costumes and all that sort of stuff. And I'd got, I'd got to know Bill through events at the mill uh, and things that were going on. 
Um, and it just felt like a, a good prospect and a good fit to bring the lab in as a space where it was a bit more of an experimental uh, play space for a group of drag queens to be able to work on costume um, and make their magic happen. And we've been there ever since um, uh, and kind of feel, I feel like we've become a little bit part of the mill because the mills, uh, the mill is very mother-like in some respects. Um, and I can't really see us anywhere else now. Me neither. Because it kind of fits our energy. Yeah. But yeah, it's a wonderful place. And um, do kind of natural collaborations and things come out of sharing that space totally. with other queens? Yeah. And also, and well, not, not only with the other queens, though. So um, the collaborations that immediately come to mind when you said the word collaboration is that there's a, a print studio directly underneath us. And I think I've collaborated with three of the people in there already. Um, so just working around people who are working in audiovisual, but also working in textiles. It's a great chance for there to be cross pollination between different streams of art. I think that's one of the really lovely things about the space. Wonderful. Um, speaking of learning, um, what have you learned about other people during this whole palaver of lockdown and so forth? Um, I've learned that their lives are radically different from my own. And I've learned that, because what's interesting, I think when, you, when you're an artist in general, but also when you're a bit queer as well, you kind of live with this, I mean, and, and not only am I an artist and I'm queer, I'm also like obsessed with dystopian fiction and constantly live um, in this, with the sort of potential fantasy that we might be heading into some kind of apocalyptic situation. That's how I've lived now for the last couple of decades, if I'm honest. And so what's interesting for me is seeing how people respond to crisis. And it's funny because I feel like the people who are prone to crisis in their life and the people who maybe are a little bit more on the edge are kind of, kind of taking things really, really well. Because it's a bit like the rest of the world's catching up with their mental state, you know, mm -hmm. your awareness that actually the world ultimately is a very precarious place. Um, so it's been interesting watching people go through that mode and maybe getting, maybe feeling like a little bit of um, strength in knowing that I feel like I'm coping quite all right with it, you know? Whereas some people are getting really annoyed about their holiday not being on. So I think, so some, I feel like there is a group of people who have really pleasantly surprised me in the way that they prioritize things that, you know, are important. And then there's another group of people who haven't quite grasped yet um, other people's realities. And I think that's, that's really interesting mm. to kind of observe those differences in your friendship group and maybe, maybe get to realize who you are most aligned with. Crisis brings out some truth, I think, in people. Yeah, yeah, I feel that for sure. Brings out all our best and all our worst qualities, doesn't it? Ooh, absolutely, yeah. And also it shows us where we are in the social structure. I mean, oh, all yeah. kinds of things around access and privilege and wealth and who we see and who we hear from has really brought that into quite sharp focus. Um, and speaking of that kind of focus, what would you like us collectively to learn and to take away from the catastrophe that is 2020? Well, obviously, the... Um, oh, there's a ringing. It stopped. <laughs> um, well, obviously, radical social revolution, Greg. You know, radical social revolution, potentially a move away from unregulated free market economics. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious, I feel like there's a lot of real great opportunities to learn some great stuff mm -hmm. from crisis. I fear though, that, that we won't. And um, <laughs> the stuff I would like us to take away from it is, you know what, humanity, if it put its mind to something, it can achieve some pretty amazing things it can mobilize on a global scale towards an end. Mm. Um, and what I would love is if, they, is, is if we learn to apply that to things that we have evidence of impacting dramatically in a negative way on the world. So it would be really lovely if we could take the way that we've mobilized against COVID and think, well, now is the moment probably to mobilize against climate change. Yeah. Now is the moment to, um, you know, actually mobilise against 
uh, or mobilize for rewilding parts of the world. Yeah. Um, but I'm a cynic. <laughs> I mean, I'm a joyful cynic, but I'm still a cynic. I, I mean, I, I, I've heard more than one person say, this is our dress rehearsal for what we will do around climate change. And I, I'm ready to upskill and organize, you know? It's a dress rehearsal for a, for a more significantly devastating pandemic. That's yeah. what I, I really feel like. I'm, and I am, I am utterly on board with the restrictions. I'm utterly like, I, I totally take what's happening very seriously. Um, whilst being able to take what's happening very seriously, I also go, well, this is actually a disease which affects a highly, a very a highly vulnerable, very small proportion of the population, um, which is still serious and still should be taken seriously. However, what occurs in a scenario where it is a pandemic like the Spanish flu that's, that knocks down healthy people mm -hmm. in their 30s? Yeah. You know, what, what do we do in that scenario? Yeah. Um, and it just makes you realise how fragile um, our particular our health systems globally are. Um, our health systems couldn't deal with this pandemic that only attacks a very small proportion of the population. Yeah. How is our health system going to deal with a pandemic that's real. Yeah, and absolutely. Big. Affects everyone. That's a cheery thought, isn't it? It's chilling and cheering. Chilling and cheering. So, Hello and welcome to Chilling and Cheering <laughs> with Greg and Cheddar. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about <laughs> art and creativity um, and its place in our lives at the moment. I feel like art is the thing that we sit at home and consume all day, even as its value in terms of artists and the lives that artists lead seem to be devalued. It's a little bit of a schizophrenic moment. You know, we want our albums and we want Netflix all day, but also culturally and socially, we've been told, you know, the making of things is not important right now. And how has that made you feel? Has it impacted how you feel about your creativity and so forth? Um, art, just like everything else, is caught up in the same traps of our society, and those are traps that are bound by by particular by particular modes of receiving and communicating information that are ruled ultimately by um, a profit driven motive. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as that is the dominant schema we have for organising ourselves, art will struggle to reach its potential. Art will struggle in um, its quest to really question meaning and uh, push humanity in a more interesting direction. Um, but that's not new. So the lockdown might have made it more aware and, and has amplified that dynamic by pushing everyone more online and now they're all sick of everything online. We wanted it online and now we don't want anything online. We just want to do real things now. Um, but whether you whether it's live or online that dynamic still exists um it's just more amplified now yeah so I, I think we're in the same struggle that we always were as artists in being able to do the work that we we find value in and then the work that everyone who's not an artist finds value in. yeah and i think <laughs> that bind is too, so familiar like you say we it's almost like we want to radically transform um but from inside institutions and, and well-funded grant programs, because that's what's available to us, you know? We, do, you, do you feel a bit, Greg, that we're like, we want, we want to radically transform, but also I kind of really want to be well off as well. And yeah. that's, that's the trouble because you, you end up, because we are, we are products of this system as well. We are, our aspirations are bound up with yeah. the idea of comfort and security and, uh, all of those things which ultimately push people to gather in resources in a disproportionate yeah. and take really the game. damaging way. Uh, yeah, of course. And like, I, I, cause I, as you know, like I run like small arts programs like this. I also work with like developing queer artists and, and the, we, I think like the lack of value that we place on, on just the hours of our day sometimes makes me, so sad and it's I mean more than once I've I've been in contact with like a very new emerging artist and said you know the fee for this work will be x y and z and they've said to me well I can't afford to pay that 
<laughs> yeah. I said, no, no, that's what I will pay you for your work and your time. Yeah. And then, you know, so yeah, we have always known this, but more clarity amplified, as you say. Um, it's interesting that the number of small grants that have appeared, which, and I don't know, I've, I don't know whether I've been quite lucky with some of those and I've received a couple of things and it's been enough to tide yeah. me over and uh, the opportunities that are coming out of the Arts Council. But it's, it's, I have no grasp on how disproportionate that is. So am I just getting more of these and actually there's a 600 people for each one of the things I got, 600 people who didn't get anything, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And I worry because because I, I am like, I mean, locally, I'm fairly wound into a lot of organizations. A lot of people know my work. I did uh, work on the television. So like I'm quite I'm quite networked in some respects. So I've got a lot of privilege in that in that sense. Sure. Um, so but it feels like there's a lot about it. It feels like there's lots of little opportunities about. Yeah. And I wonder if this is people taking funding pots and distributing them as amongst reasonably as many people as they possibly mm -hmm. can so that we can sustain ourselves to the end of this whenever. Um, you mentioned um, working on TV. Drag SOS was, I mean, it, it, it kind of brought drag back to the people for me. I loved oh, that it was you. rooted in community and also it was bringing drag to largely like non-queer or people who had not been exposed to drug. Is that something that you, you know, um, would like to do again? What's the opportunity to do that again? And was it, was it a challenge for you, a new kind of challenge? Well, it's good to know that you also watched it. I can officially take the viewing statistics up to five people now. So that's really okay. good. Okay. Um, but no, it was, it was great. It was I'm very, very proud of what it was. Um, I don't think there'll be a second season. I don't think the channel's interested in doing a second season. Okay. Um, but it was great. And I think what I loved about it was that it put queer people in a position of mentorship. You know what I mean? They weren't, they weren't the people who needed help from society. They were the people who were going to teach people about their lives. Mm -hmm. And I really loved that because yeah. so often we, we're so used to receiving the LGBT community as those in need. Yeah. and those who are disadvantaged and those who are this and those who don't really like have the same opportunities in life and actually that show was about going you know what we may live a crazy radical life to you but we can teach you something about your life yeah and that's what we set out to do so no, i'm re really really proud of it um i don't think it will happen again but that's all right i i hadn't really appreciated that dynamic actually mm -hmm. i i hadn't appreciated that particular dynamic of like the, the, the queer, queer eye there. yeah the queer that's, eye dynamic you know and that's yeah. that's what makes queer eye so compelling as well i think yeah here's what we know and here's what we excel at and here's what we can share with you yeah, yeah it's beautiful um i'm gonna ask if you can end on a message of hope for the people <laughs> i mean this will be a time capsule this piece very quickly oh god is it oh shit. i mean this, this will picture. be 17th of november we're recording this and what we've noticed about the Memories of Living series is that, is that the things that we say and do in these pieces of work that seem so ordinary to us, they, they, they encapsulate a very specific time. Lockdown mm -hmm. has its own eras within it now. So it's been really fascinating looking back even on the work to the springtime and seeing how our emotions and our experiences have changed. But we want to look forward, you know, so what, what can we be hopeful about? What, what message of hope do you have um, for people? Jim? I have, I feel that people are wise enough. Maybe that's just, maybe that's a radical hope. I feel that people are wise enough on the left and the right. I feel people are wising up to um, the dead endedness of division. Mm -hmm. I feel like people are wising up to the way that their attention is being exploited, manipulated and commodified. Um, and I think they're becoming increasingly frustrated in that. And so my hope is that we find a really, and this might, this might shock people when I say this, that we find a really good place that has a, a, a productive tension of radical thought and stability that is able to appease many people while still allowing a conversation to progress a conversation rather than an argument um, and I think that's going to take compromise on both sides but I'm, I'm hopeful that through people's frustration and their awareness that 
fighting isn't getting us nowhere, that maybe those compromises can be our destination. And that is a very big, that's talking outside of the art sector, it's talking on a larger societal level, but my hope is that that can translate down. And I mean, I have, I talk about, see the thing is, Greg, I like to appreciate humanity under a 300 year model of change. And so any change that we can envisage in any utopian society that we, we imagine that we wish to create and be part of in this world, we will never see because it's at least 300 years off mm -hmm. for those kinds of big changes to take place in society. Um, but who knows, maybe we can start digging that mountain with our spoons. Absolutely. I love that sentiment. And it reminds me, the artist Alan Al talk about the work that Alan Turing did and the work that Alan Horsfall also did. Alan Horsfall started the first gay community by launching a letter writing project mm -hmm. from his miner's cottage in, in Wigan, imagining a future where, you know, queer people could be together in safety and security. Alan Turing imagined a future of peace and also a place where technology would like serve us and to be our best selves. And Alan, I'll talk about that we are living in their imagination because we're living now in futures that they helped to conjure up. Mm. So I love that idea that we start our utopia now. I'm ready. Are you ready? Well, I'm ready. I'm so, I'm I've, been, I've, been, I've been there for the last 20 years. Marvellous. Thank <sighs> you so much for talking with us. Thank you for sharing your memories of living. It's been lovely to spend some time with each other. You too, my darling. You take, take care. care. Bye. See you soon. Goodbye. Bye.